Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great, glad to see you. Thanks for wading through the poster session crowds. It's uh, quite amazing, isn't it? And for some of you, this must be your first session for the, for the whole conference, and so we're glad that you chose this one. Thank you for making your way here today. Um, I'm Jane Krause. I'm Sylvia Martinez. And we're doing Everybody Wins When Everybody Coats. Yeah. Um, so we thought we'd have a little fun and introduce each other. Um, so this is Jane Krause. She is the queen of PBL. And if you haven't read at least one of her books about project-based learning, you definitely should. And her latest book, Computational Thinking and Coding for Every Student. Yeah. The, the Teacher's Getting Started Guide. So right. this is for people who really are wanting to get their feet wet. Yeah. And Sylvia Martinez, the inimitable Sylvia Martinez, which is who is probably why all of you are here, is um, she is a technologist herself. She um, is an electrical engineer who worked in the space um, aerospace field yes. and in game design and all the way in moving into education with a real clear and um, strong voice about constructionism and constructing to make meaning. And she, you probably know her best because of her work around making. And maybe you want to say more about Invent to Learn. Do yeah. my shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not selling books at ISTE, but these are available on Amazon. <laughs> yes, the place where everyone buys books. Yeah. <laughs> so we assume that you're in the room because you have sort of a shared belief that everybody wins when everybody codes. Um, we, we just assume that that's, that's why you came, because that title grabbed you in some way. And so what we'd like to do is just, um, here's our agenda for today. It's like, let's just talk a little bit let's, about why are we here and um, why CS for All? What's our, what's our concern about um, getting computer science opportunity in front of more of our kids? And you know what's the landscape? What are the advances in CS education? Because things are cooking fast. Um, this um, last year, computer science, there were a lot of sessions at ISTE. This year, it's, I, it looked to me like there were at least double as many. And I don't think this is going away. And you'll kind of, you know, it's not the flavor of the week. For instance, um, I haven't seen very many Second Life um, sessions on the, on the, um, in the catalog this time, um, where five years ago there, there were people out the door for those sessions. And um, I don't think this is a bright, shiny object or flavor of the week. Um, I think we're, this is here to stay. And so it's great to have you here. And um, in some way, even by coming to the session, committing to um, you know, getting um, your kids engaged in computer science. And we know that when we say see us for all, we really do mean all. But there are some issues about equity and inclusion for students who aren't your typical suspects for going into computer science. So we're going to touch on some of those things. And then we're going to talk about making and physical computing and how some of those opportunities that, again, you know, there's a ton of sessions here about the maker movement this year. Some of those opportunities tie really well into STEM, the, the E in STEM engineering, computer science, and pulling all of those things together in really fantastic ways. And then we're going to talk about how to make those things happen. Now, what we'd, what we'd love to do if we had time, and this wasn't such a big room, um, and we weren't being videotaped, um, <laughs> so you know, we would have loved to like, ask each of you what your, where you teach and what your interests are and things like that. But let's just do kind of a quick like, pulse of the room. Um, how many of you are thinking about coding for elementary? Holy, Holy cow. cow. Middle, high school. It's, there's, there's, we're nice, nice spread. Um, how many of you are already, already have a computer science class in your school? Excellent. How many of you are teaching it? Fantastic. How many of you are doing it in an, like an after school setting, a maker space, a library? A, a fair number. Wow. How many of you are thinking about expanding your computer science offerings? <coughs> Fantastic. Well, this is, this is so exciting. Um, coding is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was in college and I learned to program a computer, it was a transformative experience for me. Having things come off of the paper and actually work in real life really connected me to, to how I felt engineering could be. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of people feel that way, is that when you look at the world as challenges, 
things you can, you can tackle and solve, the computer becomes this incredibly powerful tool that when you give kids the opportunity to master, it can change their lives. So we're just going to do a little level setting here. And I don't know if you would agree with this definition, but it's the one I've been going with lately. But um, computer science is truly about posing a problem. It's about problem finding and problem posing, and posing a problem in such a way that a computer can help you solve it, right? Um, and it allows us to do all of these things. Increasingly, computer science is also about um, the social impacts of computing. And so I'm hoping within your computer science programs, you're looking at um, the, the social impacts. And, and um, boy, if we have had life lessons every day this last, um, through this last election cycle and um, just all, you know, the Sony hacking, um, there's just so many um, social implications for computing, both good and bad. Um, I like this picture because it also exemplifies something that I like to um, impress upon um, kids in particular is computing isn't just for computing's sake to make something happen on a computer. But this is an instance where this woman is a software engineer and she created software that aids in the restoration of ancient art. And so this idea of computer science and its intersections across all the disciplines is really kind of where we can grab more people. Um, there aren't a lot of differences uh, the, the, in the bi biological sense between boys and girls, but one of the things we know is that somewhat, some boys really enjoy just the fact of the computing and what they, what they are able to do with the computer, with coding. And girls somewhat, not all, but some um, appreciate more what you accomplish with the computing. So that's just a little distinction right there. But that's kind of a cue to you to um, be talking to young women about um, here's, here's what you can accomplish. You know, you like biology? Well, guess what you can do with um, bioinformatics? You know, and those kinds of conversations. You know, if you ask the computer science professor what computer science is, you'd get a much more formalized answer. And there are, in fact, academic computer science programs where you don't learn to program at all. It's all about discrete mathematics. It's about the theory behind computers. But in K-12, I know that we believe very strongly that coding should be at the heart of what computer science means, because that's how to hook the kids' interest. We can teach them formal algorithms and sorting you know, techniques and things like that. But really, the do is the most important part at K-12. And um, one of the people I think is seminal in this field, Seymour Papert, who invented Rest the logo. Rest in peace. Yes, he died Just about a year ago. Um, he invented the logo programming language. I don't know if you, any of you saw Mitchell Resnick, uh, the creator of Scratch, out in the poster session. Scratch is like a granddaughter of logo. So he created a, a programming language that kids could use to learn to think. And he said that in learning to think, they in teaching the computer to think, they, they see themselves think. And that's the basis. That's, the, that's where learning happens. And Edith Ackerman, who's another fantastic theorist, who unfortunately passed away just about six months ago as well, um, said that children learn because they're offered an occasion to use their own experience as a lever to actively explore mathematical ideas. And I think we're used to that in other things. We give kids puppets and, ta and tell them fairy tales to activate their imagination, to put them in charge of worlds that they can create. But in mathematics, it's very difficult to find worlds that children can be in charge of. And I think new coding languages for children offer those kinds of opportunities. And new opportunities for older children as well. Yeah, so we're going to show a little quick video um, from the AP Computer Science Principles from the College Board site. Um, I don't know if some of you may have seen it before. but. Um, um, I just one of the things I like about it is just the enthusiasm everybody has, every every single person in this, and it gets at um, just computers help us to think, and so just oh, it's oh. not coming through the. We might back up and play it yeah. again. Let me try what worked before. Odd introduction Work to computer again. science. It's not about syntax, it's about creativity. Again? It's good. I see computer science everywhere. Smart medicine that can monitor your body. National security issues. Sonar technology to view the inside of your body. It's saving lives, it's helping people. Computers have transformed everything we do. 
Computer science principles is a broad introduction to computer science. It's not about syntax, it's about creativity. They can read and understand how the internet functions. By the time the course is over, they'll have several apps that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for their learning. I ask my students to look at the world and to think about things that are in their world in terms of data. They can actually understand how instructions are given to the computer. We went from talking about how the internet travels and how computers started to where the first computer bug came from, an actual bug. I have people from the basketball team, football team, people in interior design, theater, tech people. Somebody takes my class, they're in the band, they want to learn about music, I'll teach it to them on a program that has to do with music. I felt like I was in the studio just making a hit for everyone. This is what I've been waiting for forever. Just showing your flavor, just showing everything through code is just amazing. Being able to press, you know, enter or run and see my world pop up. It's just like painting or drawing. My cursor is your paintbrush. A lot of girls are intimidated because they see computers as like a guy thing. If more girls were like encouraged, then that wouldn't be an issue anymore. You don't even think you're creative. And then you have a course that makes you see yourself as creative. It kind of feels like a new light has turned on. Computer science, I feel like, has really helped me with my confidence. The biggest change I see in students is their confidence. This class teaches kids how to think. Computer science can empower. Computer science is a source of making that could lead to that power. My friend and I, we just look at each other and we're like, oh my god, we finally got the code. We have breakthroughs, we make discoveries. Wow, a bunch of ones and zeros did that. Coming into that class and seeing I can design my own thing is such a powerful thing. Awesome. So there you go. Um, is anybody here teaching the um, CS, um, the computer science principles course, the new course? It's the biggest, just very few, but um, just so you know, it's the biggest rollout of a new AP course ever. And it's going to be really interesting to see this spring um, who took the course and then took the test and um, how demographics are changing. Because in the past, it was the, the test along with Latin that was taken the least often. Um, and so it's like the biggest rollout of, that they've seen in, in the history of the College Board. So it's going to be really interesting to see. One of the things that's really nice about this course and about other courses we'll talk about later is it's really inclusive of students' interests. It's project-based. Uh, kids are inventive while they're in the course. It, it's um, responding to their, they, they can um, develop their own interests within the projects that they do within the um, course. And it's just got a lot, a lot of those kinds of inclusive features baked into the curriculum. And so we're going to see kids that come out of this and they're going to really be ready to go on and have next experiences in computing. So if you're teaching at any of the younger grades and imagine, just imagine that they end up in um, CSA, um, CSP, ultimately. It's just a, a nice to think, you know, with the end in mind, right? that the work that your kids are doing, um, ultimately, maybe they'd just be rock stars in that course, and on beyond, of course. So we want to talk a little bit about CS for All. You've been hearing about this. Uh -huh. Everybody should be coding the, you know, old, President Obama learned to code. I don't think President Trump is going to learn to code, but um, he might. He, I think he could. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, the idea is that computer science is for everyone. So the yeah. question is, how are we getting there? Yeah. And I, I do want to just talk for a second about a few of the impediments. Um, and um, there are kind of attitudinal impediments, um, societal impediments to this. Um, I just have to tell a quick story about um, my experience. Uh, I am an education consultant, and I do a lot of work with the National Center for Women in Information Technology. It's a nonprofit organization. and. Um, I was doing some work, and I, I was traveling home, and I luckily got an upgrade, and I ended up sitting on the plane. You know, I'd been traveling for a week. I was really tired, and um, it was just, I'm usually pretty sociable, but I just got on the plane, and I just wanted to decompress and have that free drink and, you know, just relax. And then there's this guy sitting next to me, businessman, and um, he starts chatting me up, and I really was trying to give him the signals that I was, like I pulled out my book, you know, where are you from, and then I tell him, but I go back to my book, and this and that, and finally he asked me, well, what do you do, what, why were you traveling, and I said, well, I'm doing work on behalf of the National Center for Women in Information Technology, it's a nonprofit organization of 900 organizational members from K-12 serving institutions to um, at least four or five hundred um, colleges and universities. Every um, 
industry big deal that you can think of, and not just tech companies, but um, for instance, um, uh, MasterCard, they, they say, you know, you think of us as a credit card company, but really we're a tech company because how else could we get millions of transactions going around the globe every hour? Right, and so um, um, companies like that, um, Bloomberg News and Turner Broadcasting and um, pharmaceutical companies, um, who all have this backbone of technology, right? And um, and then the, we also have an entrepreneurial group. So I was telling them about these 900 members and how every member is committed to increasing the meaningful participation of girls and women in computing. And so I tell him that whole thing, and he says. I don't know why we keep trying to shoehorn people into careers that they're not really meant for. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> oh, Isn't boy. He thoughtful? <laughs> oh, boy. Where do I start? Do I start with the business case, the social case, the innovation case, the equity case, the personal case? So I'll just, very, just run you really quickly through all of those. There are not enough people involved in computing um, to fill the job demand, right? It's also not diverse. So when you think about women, that's a real un, um, unexploited pool of, of, of talent that, that needs to be in, um, in the workforce. Um, it's also a social case. Um, it's interesting that when they look at tech patents, you know, and when you think about patents, they're kind of an indicator of innovation, wouldn't you say, patents? When patents are um, examined and they look at the work groups that produce patents, Mixed gender groups produce patents that are more highly cited than any patents for by groups that are either all male or all female. There's just something about the secret sauce of having um, diverse um, you know, contributions. So what I like to think is that the diversity of thought that comes with um, race, gender, life experience, it, it all contributes to innovation. You know, and we, all, we end up with the better products and services that we all need when all kinds of minds are at the table. So that's one good reason for CS for All, is we want all kinds, we want diverse um, participation so that we have better innovation. And, um, and then there's the equity case, of course. Um, I don't know if you know anybody who's gone into a tech job recently, but they, they make a very good living, and that shouldn't just be um, available to um, Males, males, Asian or white males, right? I mean, everybody should have access to that kind of that kind of activity. And then also in terms of CS, when you think about it, not every person who learns to code needs to necessarily go into computer science, but the computational thinking that they develop will really put them in good footing for just general good thinking and being able to pursue other fields of STEM or just life generally. And so um, that poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> right? He left me alone the whole rest of the trip. So, <laughs> so you got your wish. So I should have gotten that, gotten that done earlier, right? <laughs> um, but um, I don't think he was necessarily convinced. But um, I really do feel that there's, um, we all benefit when everybody participates. And so that's kind of my case for why, YCS for all. So now the how. Yeah. So one of the things that I'd just like to, this is just um, brief, but there's a lot of level setting going on and kind of scanning what's going on and, and you know, can, you, don't you tell, can't you tell that it's just in the zeitgeist now that coding, coding, computer science, it's just a lot of attention in all kinds of sectors. Um, parents want kids to learn to code. That Just everybody um, is interested in this right now and it is just such the wild, wild west. There's just so much going on. And so how can we find out what's going on and make sense of it all and lay out roadmaps for um, school districts and for states to be able to do uh, CS for all, if that's what they want to do. One of the things that was just produced in the last, um, I guess it was May, was the State of the States Landscape Report. And um, Google and EDC and MassCan in, in Boston brought together um, uh, stakeholder groups from, I think it was 13 states. They're kind of at the vanguard. You know, you hear about like Texas, um, CS for Texas. There's a lot of states that have big initiatives going on around computer science. And they brought them all together and they said, how can we codify some sort of general themes 
so that we can say, here we are kind of at the vanguard. We're, we don't have it all figured out, but here we are in the front, and how do we make some coherence out of this? And where do we stand? And so there's this landscape report, and you can find out more about your own state, but um, I'm just gonna very quickly show you kind of some of the policies, there's these nine policy statements, and I won't go through all of them, but just really quickly show you sort of um, a map of what's going on around the country, and then you can be thinking, well, you know, that one state seems to have it going on in that one area that I care about. And so, um, Upside down. so I might check in with them. This way? Yeah. Okay. So this, I'm not showing all the priorities, but these are the states that have adopted K K-12 computer science standards. A lot of them are in progress, but these states have them. So this is also an opportunity, if you're not in one of these states, to, f to, to go to a, a source that you can just yeah. say, look, our neighbor is doing this. Here's what they're doing. We don't have to start over. And there's great transparency. So you can go to these states and find out what they've got. Um, another priority is that the, there's state funding for computer science education, right? I mean, you can write standards all day long, but if you don't have a way to fund new courses or teacher professional development or things like that, then you have a problem. So these states right now are um, right there. And Rhode, little Rhode Island over there, um, Richard um, Coletta, our new CEO of, um, of ISTE, um, that was, he was, their state was the first state to um, have um, statewide funding for computer science for the K through 12. So it's pretty cool that he's a, and I think ISTE's um, really um, going back to their roots in computer science um, and with, with him in charge. So those are the state level funding. Um, another priority is um, computer science teacher certification. So that's coming along nicely, you know, that you can actually be certified to teach in computer science. Another is, so for pre-service, you know, right now most of the training goes on with in-service teachers and one of the challenges there is, is you're kind of robbing one pocket to fill another pocket. You know, a lot of the people are coming out of the math and science ranks and we don't have enough math and science teachers anyway. And so it's like just thinning out that population. Um, so being able to have newly minted teachers who are teaching computer science is a great thing. So this is, this is in progress. And for instance, in Texas, you can look and see on the CS for Texas website all of the universities that are offering a computer science teaching um, certificate, um, teacher training. Um, state level computer science position, so just like maybe you have a um, state ed tech director, um, you, um, we're looking at state level computer science people who manage. Um, a requirement that the high schools offer computer science. Um, we'll look at where it's elective in a moment. You probably know that, but um, these schools are actually requiring kids to take computer science. Um, and then this is what's really coming along is that we are um, allowing computer science to count toward graduation as either a math or a science, right? So things are progressing. And um, this is just one example of back to Rhode Island. Um, I think um, I cut off um, Richard's head there, but that's Richard um, Coletta and um, the governor of Rhode Island, um, and they were talking, you know, that, that was, um, uh, they were celebrating those opportunities that they were bringing to kids that were kind of under, they didn't have good access. Um, so I'm just going to show you quickly, that is an eye bleeder, there's no reason you should even try to see it, but that is the idea of what a state plan looks like. Okay, and um, I'll just... We'll look at this little part of it briefly. I don't know if, I think you can see it, but um, the idea is that organizationally, who's involved in this? You know, what are the programs? What's the teacher preparation? What's happening across the different grade bands, right? So the, it, when you look at it, you could think, Okay, there's some coherence to this. I don't have to imagine that my seventh graders that I'm getting have never had computer science before. Um, a friend of mine said, we can't all teach loops every year. We just can't. <laughs> you know, we need to um, understand that there's a probably a curriculum spiral of some kind, but um, this is a start toward that. And here's another view from um, Boston Public Schools, just a, a kind of a different way to interpret this, a little sim more simple. 
But these are the um, kind of the computational um, themes that they're going to address and the way they're going get to get at them at each of these grade bands. And then there's the skills and the, app, the apps and software and the curriculum kind of laid out there. I think that's a nice view, too. And we also know that this is happening worldwide. This is the International Society for Technology and Education. Many of you are, are not from the United States. There's programs in, in the UK, in Australia, in, in Japan, in Korea, in Singapore, to have kids learn programming at, uh, across the curriculum. Um, and almost everyone does this sort of mapping, sort of a what do we want them to know, what tools are we going to use, how do we find the teachers who are certified and trained to do this. And all parts of those problems have to be sorted out. So we want to get to um, the, the, what this looks like. And I think some of the best examples are when kids do amazing things, like uh, this video about Maddie. My name is Maddie Maxi. I live in New York City. I'm 20 years old, and I work at the intersection of fashion and technology. As far as working in the fashion industry, things really got exciting when I was Around 16, I got a scholarship for school from Teen Vogue, and then I interned that spring with Tommy Hilfiger for their runway show. And I realized that there's this whole industry surrounding the making of garments. In order to dream big in the field of future fashion, I think it's essential to know a little bit about code. In the future, clothing will be fully responsive to our bodies. When my body's getting warm, the clothing cools it down. When I'm cold, it warms it up. As it shifts from day to light, my clothes may illuminate. The building blocks of all of these innovations are having an understanding of code. I meet with a lot of people who are starting fashion companies, and they'll be like, oh, I need somebody to build my website. And I always respond, well, why don't you learn to build it yourself? And generally, the answer is like, oh, I'm not good at code. I'm not good at math, you know? I'm not good at all of these things. And it's, it's not really a question of what you're good or bad at, it's a question of what you want to learn. I, I firmly believe that if you get involved with code now, you'll be able to help build the future of the fashion industry. So that's a lovely series of videos from Google at make it, madewithcode.com. But you know, you look at Maddie and you say, did she learn computer science in a computer science class and fashion in a fashion class and math in the math class and engineering in the engineering class? And is she a computer scientist? Or is she an engineer? Or does she have a good STEM job? No, she's a fashion designer. That's what's propelling her into these fields. And I think we have to figure out how to not just make another class called computer science that further, you know, segregates all these ideas, but gives kids opportunities to support their own passions in ways that feels natural and good to them. So when you look at computer science across the grade levels, it really does look different. You're, you're starting at a young age from simply that coding is fun, and I can do cool things with it. I can see the computer as, the, as an ultimate tool in technology to make the world into a place that's, that's, that's where I can play. In grades, in middle schools, you can start to introduce more formal aspects of computer science, emphasizing that it's in everything, that these aren't just sorting algorithms that sit outside and don't have anything to do with real life, but we can use sorting algorithms to um, you know, make projects that we want to make. And in 9 to 12, we can then have pathways for some of the kids who want to learn formal computer science, but also for students like in that AP Principles video, want to use it for music, or your friend who restores art, or fashion design. So having a lot of these options sounds overwhelming. How do we teach everything? How do we teach every kid? I think by picking the right languages and giving kids interesting challenges is where we start with that. And we also start with it at the youngest possible level. People say, oh, kids, you know, little kids, they shouldn't be on the computer. They should be playing outside. Yes and they should be playing with the computer. And the most powerful thing you can do with the computer is, um, is, pl is play. Learning about patterns, learning about representation, learning about sequencing, and thinking through these big ideas in a way that you can control. 
Languages like Logo, languages like Scratch, are designed with child development in mind. Child development experts say that when children play, they are themselves exploring the world. So when things are body syntonic, that's a developmental term meaning it relates to the child's body. They can control things. When they want to see something, they walk over to it. They pick it up, they touch it. Computer languages like Logo replicate that on the screen. When you tell the turtle or the scratch cat where to go or what to do, you're actually putting yourself into that body. It's an appropriate child. It's an appropriate childlike thing to do. It's not a childish thing to do. And you know, all of these pathways can be using CAN curriculum. But even if you have CAN curriculum, and there's some excellent curriculum examples out there at all levels, it's just a start. It's a place to get started. Because it might not work for you. It might not work for your community. It might not be what you're interested in. And the interest of the teacher is huge in hooking in the interest of the students. You know, we can't just import someone else's passion into the classroom. Kids like to see their teachers who are knowledgeable and passionate about something. We've all heard the story, right? Um, group of kids, they're not doing well. A teacher comes in and says, hey, let's build an airplane, or a submarine, or enter a robotics contest. And all of a sudden, these kids blossom. Was the magic the airplane or the robotics? No, it was the teacher's passion and willingness to go out there and tackle something that looked impossible. So this part of, of the, you can't buy this in a canned curriculum. You have to try it out for yourself. Um, and this is more than just classic computer science. This is more than just teaching kids about ones and zeros. And more than teaching what we often call technology classes in schools. Um, a lot, for a lot of schools, technology class means learning how to use a computer to do your, ex your schoolwork the same way you've always done it, just a little more electronically or digitally or easier to, to, to share. Um, computer science can be much more than that. And I think that um, there are incredible examples out there of, of fantastic curriculum as a place to start. Um, and, and you can look outside of computer science. For example, engineering is elementary. is a fantastic elementary level curriculum that so, starts to touch on computer science. Because you don't have time to do 17 new things. You have to integrate a lot of this. Um, at middle school, Project Guts is, is fantastic. Yeah, you, you talk about that one. I'll talk about Bootstrap. OK. Yeah. Um, Growing up thinking scientifically. OK. Yeah. Um, um, Project Guts is out of New Mexico, actually. It's um, growing up thinking scientifically. And it's um, computer science embedded within in science. And so it's a um, course where they've just done a mashup, right? And so you're learning coding as lo uh, on the way to solving problems in science, right? And um, Bootstrap, I don't know if any Bootstrap teachers here, or if you've heard of it. It's actually a kind of more 8th, 9th, 10th um, grade. It's actually com teaching algebra through computer science. One of the things that's interesting about that is that the kids do better in algebra learning it through computer science than they do without. It's been really well tested by the National Science Foundation, and um, it's a well-researched um, curriculum and, um, and teacher training, of course. Um, so when and people one of the say things, you don't have time, yeah, yeah. this is the answer. Yeah, and Bootstrap, um, I think it can, is a semester long. It can replace a semester of algebra, and you could teach algebra that way. One of the things that's interesting about the results is not only do kids do well in algebra in that course, but in, when they take their next um, algebra classes, even if they're not using computers or computer science anymore, the computational thinking that they gain, the algorithmic thinking that they developed, actually has them doing better in subsequent algebra classes. And you know, when I think about um, the areas where girls start falling away from STEM, it's often when they get to the more abstract subjects of math, like algebra. And if we, through computer science, could get them, give them that lift to get to be really competent in algebra so that they can continue into higher order math, I think that we've, we're solving some of our problems with um, underrepresentation of women in STEM.
I so I just that, like yeah. seeing curricula like these there's, um, developing. There's a lot of time, a lot of schools use math as a barrier to computer science, as a hurdle you have to go over. I can tell you when I was a, a video game designer, some, a lot of the programmers had been told that they weren't allowed to take computer science in school because they were bad at math. Where bad at math meant they didn't want to do things the teacher's way. There's always, yeah, <laughs> everyone, I always get some nodding. Um, this, is, this is not necessary to put that barrier in place. People can, can learn to program computers. And I can tell you the video game programmers I knew were excellent mathematicians. It's just not the math we teach in school. The mathematics of putting a video game together are exceptionally difficult. And, you know, we don't teach anything like it. I know the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics says that 50% of all, all mathematics has been invented since World War II, right? And we don't teach any of it. And almost all of it has computation in it. The computer changes math fundamentally. And we have to figure out how that fits into the curriculum. Um, and I think we have to start young. I can't emphasize this enough. A lot of people say, oh, block-based programming, that's not real computer science. I can assure you it is. In fact, there's a new variant of Scratch called SNAP, which has been used at UC Berkeley freshman computer science classes. And it looks just like this. It just has a few things added. It has first class objects added to the, uh, to the Scratch computing language. Yeah, the Harvard um, CS50 course, the first lesson, kids, um, young people, they kids. feel like kids to me. <laughs> yep. um, the, the first um, assignment that they have in the CS50 class, which is actually an online course that you can take, um, they do their first lessons in Scratch. So it's not baby stuff. It's real computer science. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of, of material out there. ISTE has com standards for computer science educators. I have to say, when I looked at this, I was a little dismayed to see that the abstract stuff is right up front. I think that's a mistake that we make in a lot of computer science uh, standards, is we put the abstract stuff first. And I think the, the doing should be, should be first. Well, you know what's interesting about the ISTE computer science teacher standards? Um, they're changing. They're under redevelopment now. So it's going to be interesting to see how, the, the, yeah, and be one of the reviewers. I think that came up in the keynote, in yeah. the plenary last night. Um, the other thing that's going on is that if, if any of you are um, the computing teachers network, if you're in that PLN, at ISTE, I mean, you probably belong to one of the professional learning networks at ISTE. It's just part of your membership. But if you go, even if you're not a computer science teacher, you can certainly belong to the computing teachers um, PLN. And that's where all of the um, new things that are going to be happening at ISTE around computer science are, are going to be broadcast. So it'd be a really good network to join. Just you can, and you don't have to just join one network, one of the PLNs. So um, I'd really advise that the, if you pick pick and add a, add a PLN, add this one, because it'll keep you up to speed on developments that are happening. And um, I know one of the things that um, ISTE's really interested in is helping in the pre-service space, this pre-service teacher preparation space. And um, so, so it'd be a good place to go to, to learn what's going on. And there's on a there. lot of crossover, too, with the CSTA, the Computer Science Teachers Association. Yeah. Um, so I think, actually, uh, joining both is a really good idea. Um, so, you know, when we say CS for all, we really want to make sure that we really do mean everyone. And there's, I think we all know some of the statistics. You know, um, girls are going into, into sciences in, in college, but it's, it looks 50-50, but it's not really. It's quite unevenly distributed. Girls are not taking computer science and engineering courses. And the thing is, we know we can make this happen. If you go back to the 70s, this is, a re this is how many women were going into um, science degrees. When there was a lot of emphasis put on recruiting women, supporting women, getting them into science degrees, the rates went up incredibly. A lot, in a lot of biology and, and sciences like that, women are, are more than the majority. Yeah. However, in computer science and engineering and also physics, the, the, the number of women has been going down lately. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that there are some cultural issues. We know that boys get more encouragement than girls from their parents, from their teachers. Even when it's not intentional and no one's trying to be mean to kids, 
it just leaks out because we're all in this culture where boys are, are supposed to be better at math and they like technology better. So we just sort of say, okay, well, my, my tech, my robot club is all boys. That's just how it is. And there's one, um, one more note on that. Um, Joanna Good, who is one of the curriculum developers of Exploring Computer Science, which is another one of those very inclusive, amazing courses. It's a, like a ninth grade computer science course. Um, she says, the privilege of advanced preparation interferes with everybody, you know, with CS for all. There's, there are certain kids with encouragement, and it tends to be white and Asian boys, who are a tiny step ahead because they got started sooner, so it makes it look like they're better at computer science than other people who didn't have the privilege of advanced preparation. And part of that's because of all the encouragement that they're getting that boys are going to be good at this and all that. So we just need to disrupt that in a way. And um, there's, um, there's just some, some um, classroom methods, some classroom practices that are going to be, we'll talk about them a little more, but that, that kind of disrupt that so that it doesn't look like there are certain kinds of people who somehow have a computer science gene because there's no such thing. But they might have earlier preparation, and then that causes them to look like they're smarter. But it just ain't so. So it's definitely not just boys and girls. Yeah. A lot of minority students want to take computer science, but they don't have opportunities at home. They don't have access at schools. Um, and this starts very young. By age six, kids already say that boys are better at programming in robots. The nice thing about this study is it was very easily changed. With just a small amount of exposure to building robots and programming that are on, these, the, what the kids said completely changed. So I want to show you a video from Harvey Mudd, which is one of the engineering colleges that took a look at its record of gender, equal, gender equity and decided to do something about it. And there's been a number of engineering colleges that have had exceptional improvements in, in equity. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is a video from the American Association of University Women, just a short clip. So the Harvey Mudd examples is a good one of how some small changes and some big changes can make uh, a big difference in the number of students, and in fact double the number of students in the program. So looking at the computer science program, Harvey Mudd did three different things. They looked at their introductory course and they changed it. They looked for research opportunities for both male and female students right out of the gate, just in that first year and second year of, of college. And third, they sent their students to the Grace Hopper Celebration for Women in Computing. Put all these things together and you see the number of female students graduating in computer science at Harvey Mudd College is around 40% now. It's a useful model because it gets down to the brass tacks. What do we need to teach students to make them enjoy and think about enjoying this field? So I want to take a look at that one slide where she talked about the three things that, that, she, that they did and um, talk about the K-12 version. They updated the introductory course. Now, they didn't dumb it down. They did what Jane talked about. They made it less reliant on prior experience. They changed the challenges, the things in media, used languages like processing that the students probably didn't have in high school. It leveled the playing field they also for entry changed, level students. They also changed it so that there were different flavors of that introductory course. So they had the green introductory course, which was for bio majors, and they had the brown that was for math majors. And so they made it very much applied computer science within the discipline. So every example, every project that they'd work on was within, like if you're a biology student, all the projects were biology projects that, that involved computer science. So, so that was a nice treat, treat too. And so I think we can take and, and make our own K-12 version. And number one is to, is to get kids coding with hands-on science, real research, real tools as early as possible. Um, and to make it real. You know, this is about research. This is about changing the world. And kids can do amazing things in their classrooms today. We don't have to teach them about being a computer scientist. We can let them do it today. And connecting to mentors, they send their undergraduates to the, to the Grace Hopper uh, Institute, not to see women engineers or see women computer scientists, but to make, develop relationships. You know, I think a lot of schools bring in women and say, look, an engineer, and then that's it. That's not 
what really works. What really works is connecting students to people who are working in real fields. And it doesn't have to be women to inspire girls. It just has to be someone who will talk to a kid, look them in the eye, and say, that's a really interesting idea. Let's try that. And, and connect to them on a personal level. And I think that in spite of everything we try, it's really hard to get out from under our cultural um, you know, norms that boys are good at computers and girls are good at you know, collaborating. There are things, I think, and especially in computer science classes, we need to watch. For example, very often when you say about making something or designing a, universe, a user interface, the criteria is make something so easy your mom could use it, right? There's a subtle hint of gender discrimination subtle. there. Subtle. Very subtle. <laughs> you know, that's a man's job. Man up. There are ladies here. You whatever like a girl. You guys, I say you guys all the time. I am trying not to. Folks. So, right, scholars, what, you know, whatever. The thing is, we know if you walked into a room of boys and said, ladies, that's an insult. If you walk into a room and say, you guys, everyone's supposed to feel good about that. I think we have to watch our language. Not to the point of being frozen. It's like, oh my god, I can't say anything but really thinking about the experience in our classrooms, of making sure that our sample data is inclusive, of making sure that, that the heroes and the leaders that we use as examples aren't just white men, that, there are, that we don't introduce biases in algorithms. You probably know the story when the Apple Watch first came out and it was supposed to measure heartbeat, it didn't work for black people. Nobody tried it. Hello, you have to think about these things. You know, uh, face recognition software that doesn't work. Name recognition software that doesn't work. Well, why? Because guess who programmed it and tested it on them and their friends. So, you know, bringing some of these outside, bringing some of these ideas into the classroom, I think helps all students understand that the world out there, that algorithms are not neutral, that computer programs are not neutral. They reflect the biases of the person who's writing them, and those have to be tested and questioned. Um, and to do that, I think I don't think there's any better place than the, the NCWIT website to get resources. Uh, there's contests, there's handouts, there's things for all kinds of different um, groups. I think the, the counselors for computing is essential. Getting your counseling staff yeah. on side, getting the kids into class, even recruiting them. If you're in high school, recruiting them from middle school and making sure that the counselor doesn't put them in study hall and because they think, oh, they won't want computer science. Or, yes, they or, will. Or astronomy will look better on your transcript. You know, those kinds of messages. I actually manage the Counselors for Computing program, and so I work with counselors a lot. And they get so activated as soon as they think of it as kind of an equity and social justice consideration, they just get right on the job and start thinking differently about their messaging around what courses kids should take. We also have some awards. Um, I don't know if any of you have um, uh, had young women apply for the Award for Aspirations in Computing, but the idea is that it supports young women in their interests in computing. It puts them into a network that it shines a spotlight on them so that the world knows that women do computing. Um, and they also have an educator award and a collegiate award. So there's some of the award programs, and they start every uh, September 1st. But this is just a lot of the resources. If you want any of them, you could see me, and I can hook you up. But they're, they're useful resources. I think there's so many resources out there. Intel has this fantastic infographic and about a 20-page handout about women. Um, and talking about the maker, using the maker programs as a way to computer science and engineering. Because this is what attracts and keeps girls. Real things, make, being able to make a difference in the world. That's it on uh, intel.com, girls in tech is what it's called. And I really believe that this area of physical computing is essential when we talk about computer science. Computer science should not just live on the screen. There are amazing new technologies, microcontrollers and small computers that you can program and build things that interest you. So on this slide, there are uh, a, a toy using an Arduino microcontroller, a jack-o'-lantern, fun, uh, uh, gloves that read sign language using pressure sensors and, and different kinds of sensors in the glove, 
and a ballet, ballet shoes that track dance movements. Now, every single one of these uses the same design process of planning, of uh, writing code, of working on the hardware and software together, and then debugging and troubleshooting because nothing ever works the first time. And yet, I think you can see this would attract and be of interest to a very different kind of kid. But basically, they're learning the same thing in the same rigorous way. Now, one of the issues with physical computing right now is the software is terrible. There's a lot of crummy software um, that just puts hurdles in front of kids. But I can tell you there's a lot of new stuff. I was like downloading press releases last night. There's Scratch for Raspberry Pi now. There's all sorts of new things coming, coming out. Um, when you can connect these block-based programming languages to the real world, and this is, is true, you can use, use them to build things that work in the real world. You can also program for things like 3D printers by using parametric uh, kinds of programming languages or something like Beetleblocks. Now, Beetleblocks is another logo programming language, but it takes the turtle off the, scre the two-dimensional screen, puts it into the third dimension. And then you can print out what your beetle drew in three-dimensional space. Um, you ready? This is the dog. Put him to sleep. Get dark. Wake him up. You can feed him. Get them to see stuff. You can adjust his eyes. But if they come in, you can drive him. Tell him to move. Then I'm hoping they'll be the one coming to me with I'd like to do that. And that's about it. You ready? So this is an example of what I call low floor, high ceiling. This is a Hummingbird's Robotics Kit. You can program, a, you can make a cardboard robot, fun, whimsical. It's a, it's a dog that, that responds to your touch and sound. And you're programming, you're learning about electronics. But that's not where it ends. When kids get access to, 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 to technology like this, the Hummingbird also runs about 10 different programming languages. It doesn't just run Scratch. It runs Python and Processing and App Inventor. You can make, that's a, a, a genetics um, machine. That's, that creates wave motion and then graphs it on the screen. It connects to Vernier sensors. That means that the kids don't have to relearn something. A lot of schools do too much, right? We say we do computer science, and we're like, this week we're doing Lego, and next week we're doing we do, and next week we're doing next, and next week we're doing this, and next, and we, and we say, okay, we've done scratch. Well, when do kids get good at these things? And when do they step up to the next level? And when do they think, I can use that to solve my problems in different classes or in my world? So I think curating the tools and technologies we pick is crucial. Um, there's all kinds of new things. I could show you a million slides, but these are just some things that are brand new. Little Bits has a code kit for grades three to eight that uses the Google Blockly app. Um, Adafruit. Aren't has they a, giving away Little Bits? I don't know. That? Are they? Are they giving what, away Little Bits? Was bit? that House Speed? What, what was House Speed giving away? I don't know. Little Bits. Yeah, mi Micro Bits. Oh, Micro Bits. Micro Bits, micro okay. bits is also new. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are things like the Digital Circuit Playground Express. They're giving away free and subsidized kits of this little onboard computer. It blinks, it buzzes, you can push a button, you can sew to, the, to those tabs there using conductive thread. It, they also have a grade seven to nine curriculum. You can find it on um, adafruit.com. And this is what the programming language looks like. Again, block-based. If your kids have done Scratch, they're going to look at this and go, I got it. So this is, a, a, this is Adafruit's version of their coding language. And this is Microsoft's version of their new code, like, coding language called MakeCode, which also works for the MicroBit, um, Minecraft, SparkFun Inventors Kit, the Chibitronics Circuit Stickers, new, brand new Chibi Clip. The, the software is getting better, finally. So that's a big step. And it's extensible, I think, is the Absolutely. Big, big idea. Yeah. And if you, if you think, oh, this is all about electronics, what's coming next is even more amazing. Nicholas, Nicholas Negroponte, who has like, predicted every invention in technology for the last 30 years, says bio is the new digital. And it's not just because you can store data. Like, you can store, store 
200 million terabytes in a gram of water. It's not just about that, but you can hack cells. You can program behavior in biological organisms. And, and this is happening in, in high school biology classes right now. So if your biology class hasn't changed yet, it's gonna. And it's all gonna be about programming and coding. So I wanna, I wanna finish up with, with one last example of a project that I love because I think it really encompasses a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Um, this is a program in turtle art. And in a culture, in a, in a, uh, a fourth grade unit of word, wor world culture, where they were studying Islamic tile patterns, learning mathematics behind Islamic tile patterns. And they asked the kids, uh, program this in turtle art. And turtle art is another variation of scratch. Um, now, a couple years ago, that's where this project would have ended. You could have printed them out or put them in a PowerPoint, put them on the bulletin board. But now, this teacher named Josh Berker uh, took it to a 3D printer and he extruded the 2D pattern into the three dimensions. Now you've got a real thing that you can print out and use to stamp clay. And if it's firing clay, you can have the kids paint them and you have a classroom set of tiles that arc from world culture through geometry to, to art to make a beautiful thing that's shareable. So when this comes out at back to school night or goes home to the parents, you can talk to parents and say, there's math in everything. There's computer science in everything. And we're doing the kinds of projects that connect these together. When we talk about STEM, when we talk about STEAM, this is what we mean. But it, it requires the most precious thing that we have in schools, and that's time. STEAM requires time. It requires carefully curated technology, tools, and materials. And the time for kids to be interested and love the things that they do. And I think that's the most important part of computer science. We can probably skip on to the last slide. Okay. We already talked about the yeah. computer teachers network. So we're at the end of our time here today, and we truly appreciate your, your attention. We know you have fantastic things to go on to for the rest of ISTE. We thank you. Uh, Jay and I are both doing sessions later on today. I'm actually doing a session in a half an hour about wearable technology, where I'll go way more into detail about how to make some of these things happen. And then tomorrow, I'm doing a session on maker spaces. Yeah, ours and, is tomorrow, and, uh, and Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. uh, tools for every page of the project cycle. Yeah. And by the way, if you're interested in the logo programming language, Gary Steger, tomorrow about 4.45, is doing a session about this is the 50th anniversary of the logo programming language. And he's going to do like a history oh, of the whole cool. thing. Yeah. yeah, it's very yeah. cool. Yeah. And so. Again, thank you very yeah. much. We're here Come talk for a few to minutes. If you want. Come talk yeah. to us. We'd love to maybe visit your schools and talk more about this. <laughs> thank you.